So good morning, my name is Christoph Kams. Welcome to the first session of, uh, of today, uh, which will deal with supply chains, monetary policy, and inflation. Let me welcome also all our speakers, and I will introduce them when they present their papers. I mean, as we have seen also in Isabel's scene setter and also the presentation we just got, uh, of course, uh, supply chains and uh, shortages and how they affect the economy, inflation, and also how they interact with monetary policy that is in place when shortages start to bind, but also how they trickle through the economy and impact on the setting of monetary policy is, of course, uh, a most topical issue. And so I'm very much looking forward to the three papers, which take the question from different angles and uh, as you will see, uh, have, are very insightful for us and, and more broadly. So let me first uh, give the floor to Diego Comin, who is a professor of economics at Dartmouth College, and he will present a paper um, co-authored with Robert Johnson and Callum Jones on supply chain constraints and inflation. Uh, in line with today's topics, supply chains, constraints, uh, you will have a constraint of 30 minutes. It will be mine. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then this will be followed uh, by the discussion, uh, and I will introduce Michelle uh, at that time. So please, Diego, the floor is yours. Thank you. That's the one that works. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us to this inaugural session to present the first paper um, and for allowing us to expose our research to the, to the ECB community. Um, as, as it was mentioned, this joint work with um, Callum Jones and, and Rob Johnson. Uh, um, and having some technical difficulties with the. The clicker doesn't doesn't work. Cool. Okay. Okay. So um, let me start by showing you some data. Okay. So if you look at this data, what you see is the evolution of inflation. Uh, this is all for the U.S. Um, what you can see is that the last four years have been extremely unusual. There's been a huge increase in prices uh, relative to what we're used to. Um, but there's been significant difference across sectors. The increases have been mostly concentrated in goods. And when prices start to decline, obviously they decline more in, in goods. Services uh, grew, it grew more slowly, and now they are higher. Inflation in services is higher than in, than in goods. Okay? Now, um, Let's look for a second to the quantities. When we look at consumption, real consumption in goods and services, what you see is that um, after COVID, the consumption of goods went to the roof and it remained very, very high for a long, long time. While the consumption of services took a long time to recover and basically only recently has been reaching the pre-pandemic levels. This is consumption. What about production? When you look at output produced, the patterns are very different. Um, for services, it's very similar to consumption. Basically, services, the production of services plummeted, and then it recovered slowly. But for goods, um, what we see is that the production of goods um, didn't recover until very recently. Okay? So though we were consuming an enormous amount of goods, um, we were not producing. There was like a wall, and we couldn't basically um, uh, push our production to the level where consumption was. Okay? Um, how is that possible? Well, that's possible because we were importing a huge number of final goods in the US. Okay? The imports of final goods, which are here on the right, you can see the solid line, 2020 plummeted, but then in 2021, they went to the roof. The import of final goods in the US clearly was unconstrained. There was a huge amount of uh, containers coming full of uh, goods to the US ports. And, and flown in other ways in 2021, 2022. However, this is in sharp contrast with the import of intermediate goods, okay? Intermediates, which is the, 
the dashed line here to the right, the quantities follow much more the patterns of production of domestic goods in the US, okay? We hit a wall, we didn't, we didn't, we were clearly, like, you know, we couldn't go over that wall, okay? Now, well, I, let, let me focus a little bit more, more on, on imports, and now, but now let's look at prices, okay? So we have these different patterns for the imports, the quantities imported for goods and services. What about prices? Um, here, the patterns, again, are very interesting. If you look at imports, in general, the price of imports increase a lot, but when you focus on goods, which is this uh, uh, dashed line in the middle, basically, there was no action. The price of imported goods was roughly flat, the huge increase in import prices is entirely driven by the imports of intermediates, okay? And this is not energy. Energy, if you remove energy from the picture, you still have huge increases in the price of intermediates, okay? So when you put together this data, this very simple data, what does emerge? What's, what's the smoking, who, who is holding the smoking gun here? Well, basically what this is telling us is that when you look at goods, and uh, for domestic goods and foreign intermediates, there is an increase in the demand for these goods, a cap on the amount produced, huge increase in prices, okay? So this seems like first order suspicious evidence that there is some capacity constraint that applies the production of domestic goods, the production of foreign intermediates, okay? You would like to produce more, you cannot, and as a result, prices go to the roof, okay? So the goal of this paper is to study this possibility, okay? To study whether constraints were, capacity constraints were to blame in a significant part for this surge in inflation, and if so, what type of capacity constraints are we talking about? Are we talking about capacity constraints for domestic production? Are we talking about capacity constraints for foreign production? Um, that's the first, the first question that we would like to understand. The second question we'd like to understand is why were capacity constraints binding? Were they binding because there were negative shocks to supply that reduced our capacity to produce? Or were they binding because demand was exploding and that was making the existing capacity insufficient to produce what we were demanding, okay? Um, those are the two main questions that we want to explore. And to answer these questions, we're going to develop a very standard framework. It's a plain vanilla framework. It's a multi-sector, uh, small open economy, new Keynesian framework, okay? This is the bread and butter model that most of you use. Uh, it's going to be a you know, continuum of monopolistic competitive firms. Demand side, the preferences are going to be completely standard, you know, CES. There's going to be some input-output linkages in, in line with the, with, the, with the spirit of this uh, CHAMP network. And uh, we're going to have both uh, imported, so there's going to be a, a domestic input-output linkages. There's going to be imports of, 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 of intermediate goods and final goods from abroad. Um, um, Pricing is going to be a standard. There's going to be dollar invoicing. There's going to be some price rigidities. Here we model them a la Rottenberg, but that's not critical. Um, and, and there's going to be a, a standard Taylor rule, okay? So everything is very, very standard. The twist, the only new ingredient in our, in our recipe is that we're going to allow for the possibility that there are capacity constraints in the production of domestic final goods and foreign intermediates that could occasionally be binding, okay? So in normal times, this is not going to be binding, but eventually, if there are some negative shocks to supply or if demand is very, very large, this constraint is going to be binding, okay? What does this do to the framework, okay? So to illustrate that, let me show you the pricing problem of the firm, okay? So this is a standard pricing problem of a firm that is determining what's the price that they want to charge for the differentiated good, given the marginal cost, given the uh, cost of adjusting prices, and given the demand they are facing, okay? So everything is completely standard. Um, the third line is the variation, okay? There is potentially a constraint that is binding. Output cannot be greater than certain level that is going to evolve stochastically, okay? That's how we're going to conceptualize capacity constraints, okay? It's a constraint in the amount that you can produce. Where does it come from? It could come many places. Maybe you cannot find your intermediate goods. Maybe you have to shut down the factory. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, workers don't arrive to your factory. 
At some point, in some extensions that we have, we are going to separate some of these differences to illustrate what's the relevant constraint. Okay? I won't have time to talk about them. That's in the paper. So the solution to this problem is given by these first order conditions. And if forgetting about capacity constraints, the solution to this problem is that the producer wants to um, solve this trade-off between adjusting prices to keep this constant markup over marginal cost and uh, reducing the cost of adjusting prices. So he wants to, uh, if, if there is a big increase in the marginal cost, he will not fully adjust the prices because that's going to cost a very large cost of adjustment. Okay, That's the normal, the normal trade-off in these frameworks. The twist now is that when capacity constraints are binding, there's going to be a multiplier associated to this constraint that is going to show up in the, in the, in the, in the pricing equation. Okay? And what that means, basically, what that reflects is the fact that this was uh, related to the question I posed in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous session, is that when capacity constraint is binding, the price is going to be determined by demand. Okay? So I don't face any trade-off anymore. I basically want to raise the price until the demand curve meets my capacity that is binding. Okay? And that's what this multiplier reflects. It's a reduced form for the fact that now the price is going to be demand determined. Okay? So in other words, the price is going to go to the roof because the producer says, OK, I need to sell 10 units, which are the ones I have available. I'm going to give them to whoever is willing to pay more. Okay? So the supply curve is going to be vertical, okay? fully vertical. Um, now, how does this affect the Phillips curve? Okay? So if you linearize the model, you impose symmetry. Basically, what this is going to, this is going to create is Phillips curves, which take the following form. So this is Phillips curve, for example, for, for home prices, for uh, domestic goods. In sector S, we're going to have multiple sectors. This is a completely standard Phillips curve, other than for the fact that now you're going to have these multipliers stick there that when the constraint is binding, is going to push the Phillips curve higher. Okay? It's going to make it completely vertical. Okay? Um, now, if you look at it, you may say, well, this is just a cost push shock. This is uh, you know, something that reflects a markup shock. The reality is that it's not. This has nothing to do with, with changes in the, in the cost structure. This has nothing to do with changes in the elasticity of substitution across different, differentiated goods that provide market power to the producers. This is just a reflection of the fact that this producer is constrained and is, needs, to, needs to set a price that clears the market. Okay? Um, so it's very different from the standard explanations that people gave early on to the, to the increase in inflation from estimation of standard Phillips curve. Okay? So they were estimating Phillips curve, and they were seeing like now that these error terms were bigger and bigger. Okay? Um, so one consequence of this framework is that because you are jacking up the prices, and you are not affecting, you know, basically because you don't face any trade-off between price and quantities, the profits per unit of output are going to go to the roof, okay? And this is something that we have seen in the data. If you focus on manufacturing, which is our, you know, our proxy for good sectors, the, the profits have gone to the roof, okay? Um, and that's, that's, that's consistent with our framework, okay? Okay, now, what this allows us to, what this provides us is an identification strategy for, for these multipliers, okay? This tells us whether the constraints are binding or not, but it doesn't tell us why the constraints are binding, okay? To understand why, why the constraints are binding, you have to look at quantities. Okay? If when the constraints are binding, you see that quantities go up, the answer is that they are binding because demand is going to the roof. Okay? If when the constraints are binding, the quant quantities go down, then the, the reason why they are binding is that there is a negative shock to capacity. Okay? That's basically how our exercise is going to work. Okay. So um, let me talk briefly about the other, the, the other elements, okay? I, I've mostly discussed all this. We're going to work on two sectors, goods and services. In, in this baseline, labor is going to be homogeneous and, and, and mobile across, across sectors. And there's going to be some exports that are going to be modeled as a function of foreign output. There's going to be um, some real marginal cost to foreign production that is going to be the same for final intermediate goods. It's going to be sector specific. Um, the constraints, as I mentioned, they are going to be potentially binding in the production of domestic goods and the production of final uh, foreign intermediate goods. And the 
the monetary policy rule is going to take the standard Taylor form, and we are, we're going to have here at the end the possibility of monetary policy shocks. Those are going to play a very important role, okay? Um, so uh, the shocks we're going to have are going to be shocks, two, sh two different shocks to demand in this baseline. There's going to be time discount shocks. There's going to be a shock to, to, um, to the composition in expenditure between, so it's a taste shock between goods and services. The monetary policy shock I already mentioned. Shocks to capacity in these two, in these two production places. Uh, shocks to the marginal cost, to, to, to marginal costs that take the form of uh, TFP shocks and uh, in each of the sectors domestically and shocks to foreign production, to the marginal cost in foreign production, okay? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the model dynamics, okay? Um, so it's fundamental to realize that once you have binding capacity constraints or the possibility that capacity constraints are binding, that's going to lead to very non-linear dynamics in this model, okay? Um, that's a reality that needs to be embraced, okay? You cannot throw that under the rug because that has humongous implications for inflation, okay? And for the understanding of the drivers of inflation during COVID. Um, so what that means is that the solution to, to this model, it's, it's going to take this form where the coefficients on each of these, uh, in, this, in this policy function are going to depend on the state of the economy and on the shocks, in addition to the structural parameters, okay? They are not going to be constant coefficients as we typically have in standard macro models in normal times, okay? Now, again, the reason why this um, state of the economy and shocks matter is because they determine whether the constraints are binding and for how long agents expect that these constraints are going to be binding, okay? And depending on how long the, the, the agents expect that the constraint is going to be binding, the dynamics of the model are going to be different, okay? So that means that you can rewrite this general solution in this particular way, where this term D is a vector of durations, expected durations, that these constraints are going to be binding at each point in time, okay? That's how we, we capture that. If D is equal to zero, it means that the constraint is not binding. If D is equal to one, it means that the constraint, for example, the home, the, uh, the domestic production constraint, is expected to be binding for one quarter, okay? So you can parameterize these, these, these uh, matrices of coefficients in this particular way. And, and, and that means that the, the, you, you can approximate, in this context, you can approximate the solution with a piecewise linear solution where uh, the coefficients are going to depend on the expected durations, okay? And, and you can follow, for example, the gorilla cobalt algorithm, you know, of being the, to solve this model um, by which uh, you make a guess on this matrix D and then uh, you solve the model under that guess and then you verify that that guess is correct, okay? So this is, this is how you compute the solution to the model. Um, however, we are interested not in simulating the model, we're interested in estimating it, in, in backing out all this information, the shocks and the, and the information about the constraint cap, uh, capacity, uh, whether it's binding or not, from the data, okay? So how are we going to proceed? Well, first, you know, as, as normal, we're going to calibrate a few parameters in the model. We're going to calibrate some, some, some standard parameters. We're going to calibrate uh, some, uh, the, the, the capacity levels in the state, okay? Um, that's not going to be critical for the results. We're going to estimate, as normal, um, the um, parameters, structural parameters that define, uh, you know, the, the acidity substitution and the and the and the and the, the production functions, um, as well as the as the shocks in the model. Okay. The critical difference with standard approach is that we are also going to estimate these expected durations. Okay. Now it's important to understand one issue here. Expected durations are an equilibrium outcome, okay? Duration, whether the constraint is binding or not, is something which is endogenous, okay? So our solution, our, our estimation approach, in, uh, starts from the premise that these are parameters that you can back out from the data, you can estimate from the data, okay? However, you need to do something else to make sure that these parameters that you, that you, that you back out are consistent with the rational, equilibriums, the, the rational equilibrium solution of the model, okay? So how are we going to do that? How are we going to ensure that everything is correct? Well, we're going to write the likelihood function of this model 
not just as a function of structural parameters or shocks, but as a function of these expected durations, okay? And these expected durations, okay, uh, we're going to have separate priors for the structural parameters and shocks and for these expected durations. And what we're going to do is when we draw, a, when we take a random draw of parameters and durations, we're going to keep only those draws that for which the durations that we draw are consistent with the model dynamics, okay? And so in this way, we're going to implement a notion that we, we have invented. Uh, we have certainly invented the name. I think the notion we have invented it too. It's called uh, rational expectations durations, okay? So the, expect the durations that we're going to, to, to use to estimate, so we're going to draw the estimates only effectively, only from uh, uh, the parameters are going to be drawn only over durations that are consistent with the rational equilibrium of the model, okay? Here, I describe exactly how we do it, but I, I won't have time. Now, very importantly, this is a process that works well, okay? So we have validated the approach by running some Monte Carlo simulations in which we have taken, uh, you know, 70 periods, and, and we have, we have um, uh, you know, simulated this many, many times, but imposing a restriction that uh, in certain periods, we're going to have very large monetary policy shocks that are going to cause the capacity constraint to be binding, okay? What we have been able to do is we have estimated positive durations for these periods where the capacity constraint is binding, as, 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 as you would expect. And we have shown that the inverse log likelihood is minimized in the true duration every quarter, and we have estimated multipliers in each, of these, in each of these quarters that are very, very similar to the actual multipliers that come from the simulation of the actual shocks in the model, okay? So the, 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 the procedure works well, okay? This is not something that just makes sense a priori, but a posteriori, we have, we have proven that, that this is a, is a valid way to back out from the data this information about when and by how much and which capacity constraints are binding. Okay, so let me use the last 10 minutes to describe some of the results, okay? So we estimate the model um, using, again, US data from 1990. Actually, that's not correct. We go all the way until the end of 2023, okay? So we have basically gone and redone everything until the last data available. Um, the observables uh, in this baseline are um, consumer inflation and expenditure for each of these two sectors, goods and services, industrial production and aggregate nominal GDP, uh, value added per worker, uh, value added per worker in each of the sectors that, that, that will give us some information about the productivity of the sector. We we'll also have information on inflation expenditure for imported final goods and imported intermediate goods. And the measure we use in the baseline of the, of, of the monetary policy rule is the, is the, is the is the Wu and Xia shadow rate, okay? Because we want to have a measure that takes into account the, the, the fact that the Fed has done much more than just set the Fed funds rate, okay? And we have tried to use, as observable, the Fed funds rate, but incorporate uh, an additional constraint, which, you know, the, the, the first constraint for which these things were invented, which is the, the zero over bound, okay? And we have found that the results are the same, okay? So uh, it's just simple, it's simpler to have two constraints than to have three constraints. But, but when we have added a third constraint and we have taken literally the, 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 the measure of the interest rate to be the Fed funds rate with the possibility of the ZLB, we get the same numbers, okay? Okay, so I want to talk about the model fit. Then I want to talk about what role do capacity constraints play? So whether capacity constraints are binding or not binding, and when? Third, I want to talk about what role do capacity constraints have played in inflation dynamics? And finally, I want to do a historical decomposition to understand which shocks have caused capacity constraints to bind and have produced inflation, okay? That's, that's the, the, the road plan for the next minutes. Okay, so, the first thing I want to show you quickly is that the model does a good job in, 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 in replicating the inflation series that we have seen uh, in, in the US during this period. And uh, the first panel is for aggregate inflation. Then we have for the three, the three, three, three of, the, of the sectors that we have, we have uh, consumers goods, uh, we have consumer services, and then we have imported, uh, imported intermediate goods, okay? And you can see that the model does a good job in replicating. So we're going to be working with 
inflation series that, that are pretty close to the, to the actual data. Um, okay, so where capacity constraints, where capacity, bind, where's capacity binding? The answer is yes, it was binding both in the final goods sector and in the, in the, in the foreign intermediate goods sectors, okay? So you can see that um, the final goods sector, uh, it, was, it, was, it was initially binding the first, the, first, the first quarter in COVID, okay? Then it was not binding, and then it went binding again uh, during 2021, okay? Big, big time. It was, capacity was binding during 2022 and started becoming more slack in 23. By the end of 23, it doesn't seem to be binding, okay? Um, what about foreign constraint? The foreign constraint is even, even more stark. Uh, not much happened the first part of 2020. Towards the end of 2020, it starts binding, remains binding all the, all the way until uh, mid-2022, and then basically it's not binding anymore, okay? Okay, so second question, how much or what's the impact of capacity constraints being binding on inflation, okay? To answer this question, what we do is we run a counterfactual by which we take the estimated shocks and we feed them into our model in a version of the model where there is no capacity constraints, okay? So we, in this way, we can simulate what's the impact of the shocks that hit the economy if capacity constraints were not a, an issue. And the answer is here, okay? So solid line is the actual data, the, the, the inflation in the data. And the dashed line in the bottom, this is the inflation that we have had with the same shocks, but without a binding capacity constraints. Okay? And the answer, you know, is basically capacity constraints explain half of the additional inflation that we had over this period. Okay? These shocks that we have, if there was no capacity constraint binding, we have produced half of the inflation that we have experienced in the US over this, over this period. So this is significant. Okay, now, um, I, I, now I'm going to separate between goods and services, okay? And what you can see is that in the goods, there is a very significant effect of capacity constraints. That, to some extent, is not surprising because you have a production constraint in, in uh, a constraint in the production of, the, of, of US goods, domestic goods. But there is also a very significant effect on inflation for services, even though we have imposed no, no constraint in the production of services, okay? Why is that? Well, this has to do with the transmission, okay? This has to do with the fact that um, constraints in the production of goods, so first, you use goods to produce services, both domestic and foreign intermediate goods to produce services, and so anything that happens to goods is going to be affecting services. But second, there is an effect on wages, okay? And wages are going to be higher, when capacity constraints is binding, and that's going to be uh, affecting more services because services are more labor, labor intensive, okay? Okay, now let's go to these historical decompositions. Now we're trying to understand which shocks were causing capacity constraints to bind and therefore uh, which shocks were causing inflation, okay? This figure may be a bit confusing, it requires some time because we have many shocks here, okay? In solid, you have the actual inflation, and so what you can see is that initially, there was these capacity constraint shocks that were causing inflation in 2020, okay? So whatever happened in 2020 to a large extent happened directly through capacity constraints. We have a fiscal, a fiscal uh, uh, extension later where we separate these, these demand shocks between uh, fiscal and non-fiscal shocks, and fiscal also play a significant role in 2020, okay? That you cannot see it here. But then, um, when you look at 21, which is when inflation started, and 22, this uh, the direct effect of the of the of the capacity constraint shocks, these are negative shocks that reduce capacity, diminishes, and monetary policy shocks becomes much more important. Okay. Now, if you stare sufficiently at this plot, one thing that you will notice is that if you add up all the lines, they don't add up to the total inflation. Okay. Some periods, they don't get anywhere close, okay? Why is that? Well, this is proof of the importance of the non-linearities of this model, okay? There is significant complementarities between these two shocks, okay? And that's something that, again, because we have a structural model and because we have a solution method that allows for, for, for these non-linear dynamics, we can 
we can study, okay? The, how do we study? We're going to study by doing the same exercise, but now combining shocks, okay? I would like to understand what happens if I take um, a monetary policy shock and I evaluate the impact of the monetary policy shock at the estimated uh, level each point in time of capacity, okay? So that's basically combining the capacity shock and the monetary policy shock, okay? And I'm going to do that for all the different shocks. And this is what, what comes out, okay? Now, what you can see is that the monetary policy shock explains all the, you know, can explain by itself all the increase in inflation in 2021. And it increases to a large extent why inflation persisted and was so high in 2022. And why inflation decreased so much after 2022, okay? So, monetary policy was critical to explain inflation after COVID. Both the increase and the decrease, okay? Why is that? Well, let me show you why. So here in solid, you have the Taylor rule, okay? So this is basically the, the rule component of the monetary policy uh, equation I showed you before, okay? And in dash, you have the shadow rate, okay? This is basically the, what the Fed was doing, like, you know, effectively, okay? And what you can see is that at the beginning, the Fed was, was quite contractionary, okay? But around 21, they became extremely expansionary. Look at this, okay? Four percentage, 400 basis points gap between, between the Taylor rule and what the Fed was doing, okay? Then when the Fed start compressing it in 22, then inflation starts to decrease, okay? So yes, the Fed is to blame. Okay, the Fed is to blame. Maybe the ECB was to blame too. We are going to reduce, reproduce this for Europe if we manage to compile the data, okay? Um, okay, so which constraint was more binding? Well, um, you can do the same analysis, separating domestic and foreign constraint. Both were important. Domestic constraints were more relevant than foreign constraints, okay? Um, okay, so let me just brief in, in, in five seconds, the extensions that we do, we look at energy, by both by removing energy from the data and by building models where energy plays a bigger role. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the importance of capacity constraints. It doesn't change the importance of monetary policy shocks. We add up markup shocks, uh, and, and we show that that doesn't affect at all the, the analysis. We are able to identify separately um, um, these multipliers from, from, from markup shocks. We enrich significant labor market. I know, I know. I, I, we enrich significant labor market by adding uh, labor supply shocks, by adding the possibility that there are constraints in the supply of labor, and we expand the model to al allow for a fiscal sector. Okay. So let me just conclude because I'm out of time. So what, what have we done here? We have developed a quantitative framework to study inflation that places capacity constraints at the center stage. Um, Binding constraints introduce a wedge in the Phillips curve uh, between the interrelation between inflation and marginal costs, real marginal costs. Quantitatively, we find that binding constraints explain half of the increase in inflation during 21 and 22. And, and the reason why constraints are binding is a combination of demand triggered by monetary policy and negative capacity shocks. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diego, for this excellent first talk. And now I give the floor to uh, Michel Gassibe, who's a researcher at CRI and affiliated professor at Barcelona School of Economics for his discussion. Please, 15 minutes. All right, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, present at this uh, conference and for the chance to discuss this very, very interesting paper. Uh, in which I actually have a lot of uh, you know, private interest. When I was a PhD student three, four years ago, and you mentioned that you wanted to work on inflation, people said, come on, it's kind of always stable. It's always about 2%. You should probably treat that as a parameter. And I'm very glad at a private level that it's back in the spotlight. So in these figures, we see that with the COVID uh, uh, recession, uh, inflation went back up which of course created a lot of issues, including issues with people in, in this room. But for researchers, it created a lot of opportunities to explore um, and test uh, theories that could not be tested before. That's a very private, selfish perspective. But I'm glad that th this paper addressed 
a lot of this issue. So what do we have is that in the COVID, in the COVID crisis, inflation went uh, up, uh, you know, both uh, consumer price inflation and import price uh, inflation. And we need a model uh, that can think about episodes of, of high inflation. And the kind of popular narrative that you could hear in, uh, in a lot of uh, newspapers and TV channels and so on, that what happened is that as kind of demand uh, went back up after the initial lockdowns, uh, you know, you could not recover production very qu quickly, either domestic production, or you could not quickly import things to, you know, uh, satisfy this demand. So uh, firms had to raise their prices to address for that. And this paper uh, does, you know, provides a very powerful academic assessment of the popular narratives, which, you know, is the, the approach to research I very much agree with. Uh, again, which is why I was very glad to read, uh, read this paper. And uh, in, in particular, it kind of develops a model that has all the ingredients uh, that are necessary to, to think about this question rigorously. So to think about both kind of uh, domestic uh, supply constraints and foreign supply constraints, you need a model with an open economy, so with uh, domestic and, and foreign firms. You need a lot of sectors to think about sectoral heterogeneity. Of course, you need price rigidities to think about inflation and, and the role of uh, central bank policy. Of course, you need production networks uh, to think about kind of shocks that originate specific sectors propagating to the rest of the economy. And of course, to really assess the popular narrative about the role of supply constraints, you actually need to model these supply constraints at the firm level rigorously, which is exactly what this model does. And that's really the main uh, theoretical contribution, embedding the, the firm level uh, capacity constraints. And then the model is estimated with state-of-the-art techniques. And the, crucially, it can uh, very well account for the inflation uh, surge that we observed. And then kind of the key finding is that uh, you know, uh, capacity constraints were indeed very important. They account for about two percentage points uh, of the increase in inflation that we, we saw in the episode. So it's uh, kind of economically significant. All right, let me briefly uh, walk through the theoretical and quantitative uh, contribution before offering some comments. So the real theoretical contribution is embedding these firm level capacity constraints in, into an otherwise standard multi-sector model. So for some firm uh, omega in sector S, there is a capacity constraint which says that you cannot really uh, produce beyond some level Y uh, bar. And as Diego excellently explained in the presentation, what happens is that if you hit this constraint, you will start you know, adjusting your prices you know, until the point where there's exactly the amount you provide. Uh, and these kind of multipliers and the capacity constraints, they need to price to demand, uh, you know, show up in a linear as equilibrium uh, as endogenous markup shocks in the Phillips curve. So we have a standard New Keynesian Phillips curve. Inflation is expected inflation plus uh, real marginal cost plus uh, this extra term, which usually in the, in the textbook of uh, Jordi Galli would be the exogenous cost push uh, shock. But here's an endogenous cost push shock coming from multipliers on the capacity constraints. And if it's positive, so the, you know, indeed you're hitting the constraints, that means they need to, they need to price to demand. All right, so uh, the, the, the markup shock interpretation is a really kind of tractable uh, way to not only think about capacity constraints, but also to distinguish capacity constraints from other sources of the inflation surge, which would work either through derailing expectations or through uh, kind of changes in the real marginal cost. So that's kind of very powerful and, and, and very good way to decompose that. So the first quantitative contribution is the fact that the model actually fits inflation dynamics very well. So when you estimate the model, you see that it can account very well for all the surges in, uh, in inflation uh, level. So that's, that's very good. Uh, the second one is that you can actually test whether or not these capacity constraints were important in explaining that. You can see that in the periods of the COVID recession, the capacity constraints were binding as we can see from the positive multipliers, which indicates that they were indeed important in accounting for the inflation surge. The third uh, quantitative contribution is saying what would happen in the absence of capacity constraints. So we see that if we were to remove the capacity constraints, not only goods inflation would have been substantially lower, that's sort of a direct effect, but also the services inflation would have been lower, which reflects its propagation through input output linkages, uh, both domestic and foreign. And, and finally, I think a very interesting also conceptual point is the role of specific shocks. That when you decompose the surge in inflation within the model into what shocks are driving that, no specific shocks can account for that. So you really need a combination of all the shocks. You need a combination 
of the supply shocks and the monetary and demand shocks and the capacity constraint shocks uh, together uh, in order to account for, for the storage. So these kind of non-linearities are something we should learn from this paper and think hard about that in, in future papers, which I'm, I'm sure there will be loads of uh, on, on this topic. Now, let me uh, offer two comments, which I hope will trigger further discussion later, because it's a topic I, I kind of feel uh, very passionate about. So the, the first one is something that I believe Isabel actually mentioned in her, in, in her uh, speech. And I think that's something you know, everyone should be focusing on. That's the role of the extensive margin of price adjustment and my, or the endogenous rise in the, in the frequency of price adjustment that we've seen in, in the data. And my kind of main comment is that the model, despite all the richness of it, cannot speak to that at all. So the model relies on Rottenberg uh, price adjustment costs, where all the changes in prices are happening at the intensive margin. So what happens is that firms that hit these capacity constraints they're simply deciding to adjust by more. So regardless of whether the capacity constraint is binding, there is no extensive margin decisions. All firms are always adjusting. The only difference is that by how much they adjust, and that's the intensive margin. And here I want to play a little bit of a devil's advocate and, and try and see what would happen in the kind of diagonal opposite of this model, where all everything works through the extensive margin. So the simplest way to think about that is to take a framework with fixed menu costs and no capacity constraints, an analytically tractable model with fixed menu costs and networks actually, is coming from my recent work with Alessandro Ferrari. Uh, and in that paper, we derive something which looks like a New Keynesian Phillips curve in, in a static model for now, but with the extensive margin of price adjustment with menu costs. And what we can see is that the New Keynesian Phillips curve in this world looks like inflation equals the real marginal cost, but the coefficient on the real marginal cost is just like in the Galley textbook. And then you have two terms that look exactly like endogenous cost push shock. So you have the extensive margin effect, or the kind of increase in the fraction of firms that are adjusting, which is driving inflation up. And you have the selection effect, or the change in the composition of firms adjusting. So if firms that are adjusting are the ones that are adjusting by more, that acts similarly as an endogenous cost push shock. So crucially, these two effects, the extensive margin effect and the selection effect, are once again isomorphic to a markup shock. And this isomorphism with a markup shock holds even in a model without capacity constraints. Now, let me push this a little bit further. So the selection effect is something it's very hard to measure in the data directly. But what we can measure in the data directly is the extensive margin effect. We can look at the way in which the frequency of price adjustment changed in the COVID episode. And with that, we can actually evaluate whether or not this endogenous markup shock, which we've seen in the Phillips curve, was driven largely by the extensive margin. And if it wasn't, that means it must have come from the intensive margin. So here, I'm plotting the data for the US from a paper by uh, Hugh Montag and Daniel Villar. So what they plot is three objects. They plot the inflation in the US in the COVID area, in the COVID, COVID period, that's the green line. And then they plot the frequency of price adjustment in, in red and the average size of price adjustment. So the frequency of price adjustment here is like a measure of the extensive margin effect, which is isomorphic to an endogenous cost push, uh, markup shock. The average size of price adjustment is like the measure of the intensive margin effect, which is uh, what Diego and his co-authors are kind of assigned to uh, endogenous markup shock. So we can see that in the period when inflation surged, we saw a massive increase in the frequency of price adjustment. So we saw a big extensive margin effect, but we did not see a very powerful change in the average size of price adjustment, which is indeed what was driving uh, Diego's uh, endogenous markup shock. So what can we take away from this? Perhaps the model could be enriched to also allow for the extensive margin of price adjustment to ensure that these capacity constraints actually affect firms desire to adjust or not. In that case, the model could really generate variation in these endogenous markup shocks that is coming from the extensive margin rather than coming from the intensive margin as it currently does um, in, in the paper. And that's my, my, my real uh, takeaway here, that the extensive margin, which also shows up as an endogenous markup shock, seems to be more important than the intensive margin, which is currently the mechanism uh, that is studied in, in the paper. So that's the first comment. My second comment is the role of domestic and international production networks. So just to come back to this figure, we've seen that both goods and services inflation would have been lower in the absence of capacity constraints. So for goods, 
the story is kind of very intuitive. So we know exactly why that happened. That's just a direct effect from the capacity constraints. For services inflation, uh, the idea is that uh, services by inputs from the goods sectors, either domestically or internationally, which makes the capacity constraint based inflation propagate to their marginal costs, ultimately forcing them to raise their prices too. So what we're talking about here is that the input output relationships are crucial for explaining the dynamics of services inflation in particular. And I think this is where the paper uh, with the richness of the model could say a lot more. So, uh, I mean, I have three specific questions. So imagine I had a counterfactual economy where I simply had a multi-sector setup, but without production networks. What would have been the counterfactual path of inflation in that world? So with that, we can really uh, quantify the role of the input-output structure as a whole. And that's a non-trivial point, because in a lot of models uh, that we see without sticky prices, networks are kind of irrelevant beyond their effect on sizes of things. So here we can really test for the network irrelevance uh, by conducting these exercises with, uh, with production networks. The second would be good to see whether specific sectors, uh, you know, that have a very high or low centrality, but not such centrality, for example, were responsible for this propagation to services. So we can try and switch off sectors one by one from the network by adjusting the kind of input output coefficients and see that whether in the absence of specific sectors, the whole dynamics of inflation would have been different. And my uh, third point is about the domestic versus international uh, networks as well as the effect of reshoring. So uh, the two exercises I have in mind here are the following. So imagine that we only had the domestic network, but we had no international network whatsoever. How would that change the dynamics of inflation uh, in this world? Imagine we had the opposite. The country was somehow outsourcing everything uh, to abroad and was fully reliant on imported intermediate inputs. What would inflation dynamics look in that world? That's something uh, that can be easily quantified in the rich uh, quantitative framework. And then something, another you know, topic and uh, catchy word of, of the day is reshoring. So imagine that uh, we decided to restructure the input output uh, setup such that for certain key industries, which we consider key for political reasons, for example, we for some reason decided to bring that back home and only buy those inputs domestically. So it's like a targeted reorganization of the network. Again, what would the effect of, of, the, of that be on in inflation either now or in light of, of uh, similar uh, shocks in the future? So over, overall, I think the framework is extremely rich. It can really explore this uh, network dimension uh, much more closely. And I think they'll be very useful for both policymakers uh, and, and academics. So I think with that, I'll have to conclude. So I think it's a very, very timely, very insightful, and a very far-reaching contribution. It's important for both academics and for policymakers, as I'm sure we'll all agree. And I very much, uh, you know, I'm very th grateful for the chance to read and uh, discuss this, pa this paper. I've learned uh, a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michel, for this insightful discussion. Um, we can now take a couple of questions from the floor, and then I would give Diego also an opportunity to react to Michel's discussion. So please. Um, could, I, could I react? First? You want to react first? Yeah, yeah, okay. Because I, I didn't sleep very well last night, and so my, my memory is very constrained. So first, I want to thank you for your, for your discussion and for looking at the paper with so much uh, you know, care and, and, and affection. Um, I, you know, yes, I mean, the world is more complicated than our model, okay? We're guilty. Um, but I think that um, the reality that you describe with that figure is very similar to what we have in mind in our model, okay? Yes, the extensive margin probably is very important. But what I saw in that figure, other than the fact that one was in, you know, mm -hmm. very shiny green and the intensive was in very light black that I could barely see, is that both go up, okay? They are in different scales. So if you scale them properly, both are going to move a lot. And I think that the reason why, you know, you, you want to adjust is because, you know, the, the gap is larger and you want to adjust by more. So I think both margins are important in the data. I think for, for, our, for our story, it really doesn't matter. Because basically, when you hit the constraint, you are going to adjust prices and you're going to adjust it by a significant margin. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we model it in a particular way. We are, especially Rob and I, are not, you know, monetary economists. We are not, uh, you know, people, pricing people. So for us, we just want to use a framework that allows us to analyze these things in the simplest way. 
I'm sure that we can enrich this much more and do it more carefully, but, but I think that for the analysis and the results of the analysis, I don't think that's critical. Um, and I take the comments on the, on, the, on, the, on the networks. I mean, I think these are things that we can check. Sorry. Right. No, thank you. So, uh, questions from the floor? Yes, please, just wait one second for the mic, and if you could please stand up and give your affiliation. Yeah, uh, Philip Pfeiffer, European Commission. There you go, thank you for a great presentation. Um, my question is whether you've considered some special situation of the pandemic, namely a shift in sectoral preferences of consumption. So you mentioned mm -hmm. aggregate demand shocks, such as monetary policy, but it could also be that we have a large shift towards goods that can be consumed at home that might uh, trigger a stronger than expected increase in capacity constraints in these sectors specifically. Thank you. Yes, we, we, we include that in the, in the, in the, in the model. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm a structural transformations guy, at least for one paper. Uh, uh, and, and so when I look at that figure, uh, you know, the, the share of, of, of expenditure that goes to consumption, how it changed, basically, it was the closest thing I've seen in my life to an earthquake in economics, basically. We were going back like 40 years um, in, in one quarter. Um, I thought, wow, this is huge. So we were like extremely biased to find, like, you know, mentally to finding like that matters. But there are two demand shocks. One is the, actually we have three. We have the fiscal shock, the time discount rate, and the sectorial composition shock, the taste shock. The last one is the, less impo the least important, uh, which is very surprising, but it really doesn't matter much. So we, this is why we are getting all demand shocks in one. Like, you know, sometimes we separate with fiscal, but yeah, it's, it's surprisingly unimportant. Yeah, Benoit, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, so um, you, you said you estimated the, the model for a fairly long uh, uh, history, um, going back, uh, and, and you presented essentially the, the recent period, but I was curious whether there were previous instances where capacity constraints uh, did make a, a, a difference and were, were significant. So we, yeah, we have gone back. So in, in this in this exercise, I show you, you know, basically we allow capacity constraints to bind starting in 2020. But we have gone back earlier, and we don't find we, we don't find that we have ever been close. So I think that this is the interesting thing about one interesting thing about this thing is that this is a one in a lifetime. Like you know, I don't think that the the, the central banks, okay, just you know, understand whether I blame them before. I, I have to give them some uh, understanding. This is something that is happened for the first time, and so you know. Uh, the, the next paper we are we are working on is to to, to try to understand uh, this from a normative normative perspective, allowing for uncertainty in the beliefs of the central banks. Thanks. So we I have two more questions. Hi, Diego. This is Federico from the Bank of Italy. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation. Um, so, uh, when when thinking about the um, the question you're you're tackling, I was I was just simply looking at the FRED uh, um, uh, data, right? And I saw immediately that uh, capacity constraints. So I went to capacity utilization, and I didn't see that it actually raised too much with respect to the historical. Uh, levels. Uh, on the other hand, then I went to manufacturing orders and they raised a lot. Uh, and so this seems on one hand that yes, there were a lot more orders. On the other hand, I didn't really see that uh, capacity utilization went to 100%, for instance, stayed to 80. And so from this, I was just wondering, uh, through the lens of your model, can you point at some um, sufficient statistic uh, or something uh, from the data that would tell us when uh, the probability of, of, of being at this uh, binding constraint uh, becomes very high. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, th there is a long literature criticizing utilization measures from, from, from the board and from other, like, you know, going back to Shapiro, like, you know, that basically puts them at a very, very low level of, of trust. Um, so this is one figure from Fred that somebody pointed to me that I think is, you know, first order sign that, that what we are saying makes sense. If you look at investment in infrastructure, in manufacturing, okay, like, you know, buildings and, and factories, and it was flat always. It was completely flat, okay? And then starting in 22, it more than doubled within the year. It's amazing. Like, you know, you look at the data, flat. And then at the point where you see that, like, you know, with a delay, of course, that capacities are binding, then suddenly people start building new factories and new, new invest massively in infrastructure in the US. That's an incredible uh, figure. 
check it in Fred, and it's uh, to me it's like you know it's, it's this is something that we, we we didn't try to. I mean, it's it's something that we learn ex post. Okay, then Frank, please. Um, great paper. Um, at the end, you mentioned that you also look at uh, the labor market. Yes. And, which is, of course, one of the other alternative yes, yes, yes. narratives. Um, I was wondering what, what, what did you find? Yes. So we basically allow for both. Um, so we, we re-estimate the model matching hours, uh, nominal wage growth. And, and, and we allow for shocks to, we, we have, we introduce wage rigidities, uh, in, in, we have a wage Phillips score, and we, we introduce, we allow for shocks to labor supply, and, and also we introduce an additional constraint on the, on the uh, number of hours that workers can supply, okay? Suppose that you want to supply more, but suppose that on top of it there is a constraint, sorry, you cannot go, you cannot go to the factory, okay? We find that those constraints are important in 2020 for one quarter. Okay, like basically when factories close and when you couldn't leave, that, 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 that quarter they are massive, okay? After that they are not important basically. And, 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 and the role of uh, production capacity constraints remains unaltered and the role of monetary policy remains unaltered, okay? So I, I have in my slides the results, so you can, or in the paper it's all there. But, but basically the, the, what the model, is, the, what the analysis says clearly is that it's not, it's not about uh, workers don't, don't, you know, having negative shocks to labor supply. That's, that's not what the reason why inflation went up. It's not about reallocation between sectors of labor. It's, it's not about constraints on, on, on the supply of, of labor um, um, other than in the first quarter of 2020. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we need to move on, but let me thank uh, Diego and Michelle for an, for an excellent first part of the session. Thank you very much.